Okay, explain this to me like I'm an eight-year-old. Why would you ever bother spending any time listening to a podcast's commercials? It's not that hard to fast forward and get to the main event of the show, of course. But here's my answer about why you shouldn't do that. See, some of us podcasters don't just read dull ad copy. We spruce it up. No corporate drone wrote this for me to just read verbatim like some kind of by-the-book lawyer. I wrote this little spiel all on my own. And while I am reading it, no one would compare me to an attorney. Although some people would probably think it's more than a good start to chain me down at the bottom of the ocean. It's cruel. And anyone who has skipped past this ad will miss me saying that it's wonderful to be able to enjoy the freshest, fairly traded, premium Arabica beans in Canada, which are offered by Spark Plug Coffee. Canadians and Americans can order half-calf, decaf, or the regular calf. Whatever level of caffeine is coming your way, we'll get there within a week. And the shipping is free for those who live on my side of the border, way up here where we're a little slow, we're always nice, it snows constantly year-round, and we mate with beavers. Those are not stereotypes, my friends. They're out-and-out -out facts. I've heard that Tom Hanks is a coffee fanatic, although I don't know how he takes it. I'd love to tell him that the delicious spark plug comes in many blends and roasts, including rotating seasonal blends. And if you decide, or if he decides, to be a member in good standing of the Autopilot Coffee Club, you, he, whoever, can score perks and a whack of deals that a casual buyer can't. And you, good people of the jury, will save money on every order. A person's life can get all haywire if they contract an incurable disease, so they might need to pause or maybe even cancel their membership at some point. Sparkplug gets that, and you, my listeners, can indeed pause your membership for a spell or just tell them you want out altogether. So this is not a copy of the month club, your honor. Before we get to my opening arguments in this movie review, you need to type sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S into your browser. You'll get a one-time 20% savings by using our H-Y-E-S promo code. All right, then, in order for you to hear my extensive thoughts about this Hanks Washington extravaganza, I need to ask Andrew Luther to give us a piece of his musical mind. And, Andrew, action! Have you ever seen... Philadelphia. Happy mid-November, film friendos, and thank you for pressing the play button on the 549th edition of Have You Ever Seen... This podcast looks back at classic films and spoils them pretty thoroughly. We do that every Monday and every other Friday. These end-of-the-week episodes are always a one-man effort, though, and that one man is Ryan Ellis, also known as the TV Guy. And I really have been a TV guy for the past 25 years. I work at the CBC in Canada. My wife, Bev, is a Monday performer. She's also a TV person, by the way. But you're only going to get this one voice in your ears today. And I hope this voice holds up. Bev and I are still battling covid she first showed symptoms about a week ago, but is still coughing sometimes. She's working from home today, so you might hear her hacking away in the basement from time to time. As for me, I'm feeling all right, but talking for about an hour might harsh my throat, so I'll keep the water handy. Anyway, impressions will crop up during this episode because even very serious motion pictures need a little piss taken out of them. What I'll be doing is inching my way through Philadelphia in sequential order, throwing in many asides and age storyline or not, indulging my tomfoolery bone, even if only a tiny bit. So, Philadelphia was released by TriStar Pictures right before Christmas, 30 years ago in 1993, but it rolled out wide in the early part of 1994. The film cost about $26 million to get to the screen, then went on to cash in 200 mil worldwide. So for those who said what Jonathan Demme did with this flick was too safe and sanitized for a movie about gay people, and especially since it was one of the few major movies that had been made about AIDS at that time, well, it reached a lot of viewers. That's not nothing. And maybe you have to start with a saint to get Hollywood to make gay movies where the characters aren't practically perfect in every way. Rotten Tomatoes critics have been kind to of this flick for low these 30 spins of the earth. 81% of them dig it, as do 89% of audiences. 63 critics have filed reviews on there, although their average is quite a bit lower than you might expect, considering that 81% total. It's only 6.9 out of 10. Speaking of the old tomatoes here, Jonathan Demme tends to do very well by them. He directed this, he directed Silence of the Lambs, that, not surprisingly, was well-reviewed, but the movies John directed in general did tend to get fresh reviews, as did the ones he just produced, like Hanks's That Thing You Do and Spike Jones's Adaptation. But do you know what tops the RT list for the dearly departed John? It's the Talking Heads concert film, which was just recently re-released. Every single critic on there has liked it, 100%, and 97% of audiences, too. That outdoes even the terrible screaming of the lambs, Clarice. I said Philadelphia made money? Well, it grossed over 77 million bucks at the North American box office that year and wound up 12th, just a little ahead of Groundhog Day. 
Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg were years away from working together, which they have done so often since that first experience when they made Saving Private Ryan. But 1993 was the year of Tom and Steve separately because Philly did well, plus Jurassic Park was the biggest hit of the year, and Spielberg also had the Oscar smash, and a pretty big hit too, with Schindler's List. We've reviewed all those movies I just mentioned, and we just reviewed The Remains of the Day four days ago. That was 66th. All those rankings are about the same when you account for worldwide grosses, incidentally. Bit of a sidebar here. <laughs> sidebar courtroom movie. I found this fascinating about the box office that year. Maybe this was common back when movie stars drove the business more than they do now. It's more about IP than it is about the stars. But all the top 10 movies involved superstar names. I didn't look the other years. It could be common, but I don't know. This year it was. Jurassic Park was directed by the most successful filmmaker of all time, Spielberg. Number two was Robin Williams' movie, Mrs. Doubtfire. Number three was a Harrison Ford film, The Fugitive. Number four was a Tom Cruise movie, The Firm. Number five was a Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks rom-com, Sleepless in Seattle. Number six was a Robert Redford effort, Indecent Proposal. And Demi Moore was pretty big then, too. Number seven was one of Clint Eastwood's best flicks, In the Line of Fire. He was a box office star in the 80s and obviously here in the 90s. Number eight was Denzel and Julia Roberts in another legal movie, like he did here, Denzel did, The Pelican Brief. Number nine was Spielberg again with Schindler's List. And number 10 was Sly Stallone leaping off of mountains in Cliffhanger. And Sly was still thought of as a big star at that point. He wouldn't be not that long after and for a long time. No, a bit of a box office poison guy. So maybe there are other years where the top 10 were all huge names, but 1993 just proved it. They were. Back to Philadelphia's achievements. Tommy H. won his first of two straight Best Actor Oscars for this, beating up the likes of Liam Neeson, Lawrence Fishburne, Anthony Hopkins, and Daniel Day-Lewis. DDL had a shot at playing Andy Beckett, by the way, but did In the Name of the Father instead. Neeson and Fishburne were up for their first Oscars and have never been nominated again, but Hopkins won the trophy two years earlier for Silence and won another one many years later for The Father. God, he's good in that. While Day-Lewis has won three times, once before this and twice since. Maybe Hanks wasn't the best choice to take it home in 1993, and it's likely the Academy members would have held off voting for him if they knew Forrest Gump would be coming out the very next year, but it's not like he was unworthy. A guy I used to be friends with did always say that it was the flat-out wrong choice, but I just don't agree. Was Tom the fifth best of these five guys? Well, that's debatable. Maybe he was. It was a strong year. It was one of those years where being nominated really could be called a victory in itself. Eastwood was worthy for that performance in In the Line of Fire. Robin Williams and Mrs. Doubtfire. I think he won the Globe or was at least nominated for the Globe. Hell, Denzel was worthy for his work in this very film. Sometimes a year has eight or ten worthy performances and you can argue all night about who should have won. So I'm okay with it being Hanks. It's a good group of guys. They all seemed happy for him. Tom got an enthusiastic handshake from Hopkins after Emma Thompson called his name, and then he got a hug from Neeson on his way to the stage. Fishburne and DDL seemed happy for the guy, too. It's a nice moment because there have been plenty of examples of actors or actresses who don't seem happy at all that somebody else just won. Case in point, Angela Bassett just earlier this year when Jamie Lee Curtis won. These four guys either hid their disappointment well, or they were truly happy for the guy. Hanks gave a really good speech, paying tribute to his wife, Rita Wilson, and the team that made the movie, especially Jonathan Demme, Denzel, and Antonio Banderas. And then he got very serious in thanking two gay men who were mentors in his youth. He also gave a shout out to those who were suffering from AIDS or had died from it. He said, there are too many angels in heaven. I wonder if that's maybe where Angels of America came from, the title of that play. He even manages to name drop the Almighty and ends with God Bless America. Maybe not everyone knows this, but Hanks and Washington have always been devout, and Hanks was also a patriot long before he saved Private Ryan. A big influence from this movie was on Frank Oz's In and Out. The writer of that flick, Paul Rudnick, supposedly came up with In and Out after hearing Hanks say in his Oscar speech that he admired his gay teacher. I forget if the real-life teacher was in the closet and Hanks outed him, or if Rudnick just came up with the idea of what if he did out him. Well, either way, Kevin Klein got to play that part in In and Out, and a pretty solid late 90s comedy was born. Bruce Springsteen is one of many rock stars who have an Oscar on their shelf. It's surprising just how many legends of music have written a song that took home a gold naked guy. Dylan, Elton, Gaga, Eilish, Common, Legend, Adele, Etheridge, Lennox, Eminem, Phil Collins, Lionel Richie, and Stevie Wonder. They've all won Oscars just in the past, say, what, 40 years or so? Well, Bruce won for Streets of Philadelphia, which was presented by Whitney Houston. So that's quite a power duo sharing the stage. The boss mentions he had never written a song for a movie before, so to quote him, I guess it's all downhill from here. Then he shouts out Neil Young, who wrote just plain Philadelphia for this flick, and was nominated in the same category. In fact, in a symbiotic touch, Springsteen's song opens the movie, and Young's closes it, and his is very good too. Ron Nicewanner's original screenplay was nominated, and so was the makeup by Carl Fullerton and Alan Dangerio. For the record, Jane Campion's screenplay for the piano won, while the Oscar for makeup went to Mrs. Doubtfire. 
a movie I covered this past Labor Day, and The Piano we covered many years ago. Incidentally, one of the reasons they got Bruce to write a song for this film was to bring mainstream appeal to the movie. They got Bruce. Pino from Do the Right Thing must have bought a ticket based just on that, although Mookie would insist Pino is a Prince guy. Trying to appeal to people who might not want to see a gay film or a flick about AIDS, or both, was also a reason to cast two big stars in the main roles. We don't have to like that it was ever true, or remains at least somewhat true now, but they weren't going to get this movie made at all if they put a gay actor in Hanks' role. Who was even out in 1993 and was thought of as a box office draw? Those two things, both. Not just one or the other, but both. Out and a star. Tom has said, and this was, I think, recently, you'd have to cast a gay actor now. I believe he even said in that same interview he would turn the role down if he had it to do over again. I think that's revisionist history. It's easy to say they did wrong by putting a straight guy in the Andy role, but if they hadn't, then the money man would likely have said, no, that might make your blood boil, but facts are facts. I'll dig back into this angle and some other controversies a little later on, though. As far as American Film Institute lists go, <laughs> we struggle on that every time. American Film Institute. Andrew Beckett was 49th on the goody-goody side of the top 100 heroes and villains list. I guess that was for standing up for the wrongfully dismissed. He seems like more of a victim than a hero to me, but so be it. I certainly admire his courage. Streets of Philadelphia was 68th on the top 100 songs list, and the movie itself was 20th on the top 100 cheers. Two other Hanks flicks, Saving Private Ryan and Apollo 13, were 10th and 12th on that list, while Forrest Gump was 37th, so the AFI often felt very inspired by what Tom Hanks brought to the big screen. Especially in the 90s, those are all 90s films. In fact, they were released in a span of about five years. Tom was very inspirational to me. Philadelphia was also a candidate for the top 100 genres in the courtroom category, but didn't make the cut. And finally, the film was up for the 1998 and 2007 AFI lists of greatest American movies of all time. All that AFI cred proves this film was still striking nerves well into this century. It wasn't just, oh, look at the gay guy dying of AIDS, let's bow our heads for a moment, give him an Oscar, and then move on. Philadelphia stayed in people's minds. All right, let's pop the top and see what this picture is all about. We start with various shots of the fighting city of Philadelphia, as Bruce Springsteen's song that I just talked about provides the soundtrack. I noticed that one of the shots in the montage is of a store called Condemnation. Not Condemnation, but Condemnation which might be Demi's way of implying that if Andy Beckett had practiced safe sex during his casual encounters, he might not have gotten HIV. This isn't a judgy movie, so that's probably not what Demi was going for. All I know is there was a prophylactic store in Pennsylvania, and they felt it was worth including in the montage. Condemnation, I like that. Our first proper scene is Tommy H. and Denzel W. in a judge's office as opposing lawyers, Andrew Beckett and Joe Miller. The men who will spend most of this movie as colleagues working together start out as opposing counselors on some kind of land development case. Joe leans in close to Andy at one point, which he will be very reluctant to do later, after he finds out what's in Andy's bloodstream. I'm sure that's a deliberate piece of blocking, to have them get that close to each other so early on, and then not for a while. Although, when I put Philadelphia in the IMDb, to always have it ready if I need to quickly look at something. The, what is it again, the trailer, I guess it is, do you see that? If you hit play, it'll show you the two-minute trailer, was a shot of them in the courtroom, basically right beside each other. So, I'm going to talk later on about getting close and physical at the very end of the movie, but yes, even during the storyline, Denzel's not shying away the same way as he will in a scene we'll talk about in a few minutes. So notice after that meeting with the judge, they get in the elevator at the same time, and a man with a cast in his head and two crutches has to be the one to press the down button. That's because the two lawyers immediately start talking to their mini recorders, and they don't even notice this man in front of them, who probably shouldn't be the one to have to press the buttons. So even Andy can be a little oblivious to people. Andy seems to head straight from this meeting to the doctor's office for some kind of treatment, He's already got AIDS when the story starts. His doctor is played by Karen Finley. She didn't act on the big screen all that often. She seems to be better known as a performance artist, a poet, and a musician. And if you look up her stuff, one of them's, I'm not going to swear today or be crass. I want a G rating on this podcast. One of her books or poems or something like that. Pretty crass word. I bring her up though, because I especially love a scene she has with Hanks at the end of the movie, but we'll get to that. Hey, it's Hollywood royalty. Joanne Woodward plays Andy's mother, Sarah. She's not in this flick all that much and definitely doesn't have a lot of dialogue, but she brings plenty of gravitas to the proceedings. She's always in the courtroom. I think the whole family is often in the courtroom through most of the picture when they get to those scenes. In this scene, she can barely keep from weeping when Andy talks about his blood work, which he says is good, but she's got to be terrified that he's going to die fairly soon anyway, no matter what he says. I think a mother just knows. And he lives for a while, about a year from the start of this film, but that's still not that long. But this is as key a scene as there is in this film when Andy is called in to talk with Jason Robards, Robert Ridgely, and the other big bosses. 
They're handing a big case over to Andy and are all handshakes and hugs because he's been doing a sensational job and deserves this opportunity. Although they'll claim during the trial later on that he was incompetent and that's why they fired him. Of course, the real problem is that, as Robards later says, he brought AIDS into their office. They had to be horrified to realize after the fact that they touched a man in that condition. We know now they shouldn't have been so concerned because hugging somebody who has it or shaking their hand isn't how you contract the virus. But a lot of people were slow to learn about how communicable AIDS was. Princess Diana did a lot to make people realize just being in contact with somebody who has this isn't going to kill you. She'd sit right beside people who had AIDS, put HIV babies on her lap, and so on. Nine days pass and the bruise Andy had in the you're the man scene with his bosses has gotten worse. And of course, Ridgely noticed it. Plus, he has another one now. A worsening condition doesn't mean he isn't still working hard, though. He finishes up some paperwork and leaves it on his desk, enjoying a cigar in celebration of a job excellently done. But Andy can... Maybe it's Robart's desk. Anyway, he leaves it on the desk, thinks it's done. But Andy continues to go downhill. While working from home, he has a woman apply makeup to cover up his pale face, which is both slightly comical because she's making him so orange. Oh, he looks great, that bronzer. But it's also maddening to think you have to hide that you're sick, no matter what's making you sick. I was 19 in 1993, so I'm sure I wasn't eager to touch people who had AIDS either, but intelligent men like his bosses and co-workers really should have researched this disease as soon as they found out he had it. If you can't get it from shaking a hand or touching an office door that Andy had touched, as they would have discovered if they bothered to find out, then you can stop acting like he's breathing death directly into your mouth. I know I'm playing 30 years on quarterback here, and I resent when people do that all the time on social media, but if you're confronted with AIDS and you have enough money and resources to learn something about it, then that is a reason to mock these guys for this behavior. Of course, they're homophobes. That's the real problem here, and we'll come back to that later, too. But back at the office, Bradley Whitford is freaking out that the paperwork Andy thought was settled is now missing. We'll learn later, without absolute proof, I guess, but it seems pretty likely that Charles Wheeler, the Robards character, ordered the files to be quote-unquote lost so they'd have what they think is an excuse to fire Andy. But they found the paperwork miraculously at the last minute. We haven't seen Denzel in a while, but a month passes and we get back into his life, this time as his wife is in the hospital having a baby. I love the detail Demi puts in here that Joe can't work the camera, so the woman who just gave birth has to do it for him. And we get another nice touch when Joe is the one asleep in her hospital bed while she's wide awake, cuddling with him and their newborn. Lisa, by the way, is played by Lisa Summerhour, who has a small role in The Sixth Sense six years later. Joe's always being called the TV guy, and he's clearly an ambulance chaser. We also get evidence that he's not too comfy around gay guys or people with AIDS because Andy comes in for an appointment, reminding Joe that they already know each other. That connection gets a hearty handshake from Joe before he quickly pulls away once he hears about the AIDS thing. Great cut, too, by Demi when he goes from a close-ish two-shot to a fairly high overhead angle right after Hank says, I have AIDS, symbolizing the distance between them. Joe gets quiet and takes note of everything that Andy touches, probably making a mental checklist of what to scour with cleanser when the man leaves. Andy is here because, of course, he was fired and wants to sue for wrongful dismissal. He's desperate because, after all, Joe Miller is nobody's first choice, and he was Andy's tenth we flash back to the day Andy was fired. Demi again uses great blocking by having the partner sit about 40 feet away from Andy in the conference room. Robards, of course, plays Wheeler. Robert Ridgely plays Walter Kenton. Hey, what do you know? I just talked about a Miss Kenton during our Remains of the Day podcast four days ago with Bev, a film that was released about a month before this was and competed with it and Schindler's List and others for a lot of those Oscars. Wheeler claims Andy has an attitude problem and nearly blew that case for them by misplacing the documents. As Andy tells Joe once we come back to the present, he was sabotaged. Saboteur. But Joe just doesn't see a case here, and we know why. Andy goes down to the street after failing to get Joe to represent him, and Hanks gets to play I Am Truly All Alone in this in a way that shouldn't have shocked us for the depth he brings to it, but at this point in 1993, he wasn't really Tom Hanks yet. Yeah, he'd done Splash and Big and some other things, but he was on a bit of a wane there for a little while. We know now he can play just about any dramatic angle on a character or play by himself for about an hour and a half on an island with just a volleyball. And of course, he brings a lot of funny angles on things too. Not so much, well, we knew about the funny, especially then, but not really the serious stuff. It's a powerful moment, and unless you're a complete jerk face, you have to feel for the guy. I guess his former bosses wouldn't. Joe makes sure to see his doctor later that day because he's worried that he might have caught the virus just by touching Andy and having Andy touch some of the stuff on his desk. The doc tells Mr. Miller that the only way to catch HIV is to exchange fluids with someone who has it. Or, wait, it's blood specifically, right? You can't get AIDS from tears or saliva. We know that now. In any case, this scene is clearly here for us to get confirmation about how AIDS is contracted. This is one of those scenes that isn't literally saying to the audience, listen, this means something important about something in reality, but that's what it's doing. 
Joe goes home on his claim to not have a problem with gays, swerves quickly to him spouting off about what disgusts him about the homosexual lifestyle, especially gay sex, and even tosses off the dreaded F word. His wife is cool with homosexuals? He's not. So however Denzel the man felt about homosexuality, he really sells his contempt for our gay friends in this section of the film. I hope this was just acting. He's a great actor, so it probably was. Let's have faith. Joe spends time doing research in the library where Andy happens to be working away at legal matters of his own. Tracy Walter plays the librarian who's not subtly suggesting Andy would be more comfortable in a private room. Jeez, man, the guy doesn't look that bad. I would have known he had AIDS. I don't think I would know somebody who has AIDS even after seeing this movie and many others that are like it. If someone looked like that in a library, I wouldn't think that's what they have. Anyway, Joe goes from trying to avoid being seen to making a point of going over and saying hello. The two men are polite, but Andy doesn't care to do much more than ask how the Miller's baby is doing. Until Joe pulls a Columbo and wonders, one more thing. He asks Andy how the boss has figured out that he had AIDS. And this is our shorthand for knowing that Joe will take the case. Howard Shore's music helps to confirm this connection too. A little overbearing here. It seems Andy has found precedent that you can't be fired for having AIDS any differently than you can't be fired for having cerebral palsy or something like that. Joe shows up at a 76ers game where Andy's former bosses are enjoying themselves in a private box. Dr. J himself has a cameo, as himself, just to remind us the movie is set in Philadelphia, I guess. Miller shows up to serve Walter a summons and to shake Dr. J's hand. And this was economical. This happened in basically one scene. Joe didn't want anything to do with the case, and now suddenly he's representing Andy. Although, obviously, a certain amount of time has passed since the library scene. And it makes sense that Joe would take this case after all. A black man should side with a fellow underdog. It's also, somewhat curiously, never a factor that Joe is black. I don't think it's even mentioned by anyone, is it? Denzel has done a lot of race-related movies, and he had at this point in his career. But I guess Demi just wanted a great actor in the part. It wasn't about his skin color. And on the note of Denzel being a great actor, I think I read somewhere that Hanks said Washington is the best he's ever worked with. This is fairly recently, so he's had all those years since he made this movie to say that about this guy. I'm not that surprised. He'd certainly be on the short list for probably anybody. As the Wyatt Wheeler lawyers leave the stadium, I didn't write down the entire name of the firm, but Wyatt Wheeler, Brown, I forget their names. Wheeler shows us just how much Andy's firing was about being gay. He tosses off some bile about Andy's lifestyle and how he brought AIDS into the office, the men's room, the company picnic. Not the picnic! There was salad dressing and paper plates there! Andy could have done something gay with Walter's grandson's hot dog! It also appears that Bob Seidman did know Andy was sick. He'll talk about this on the witness stand much later on, even though he's telling the bosses at this point that he didn't know. Bob is played very well by Ron Vauter, by the way. I think she could argue he didn't know that Andy had AIDS, but he suspected Probably to avoid letting the movie get too dour and also to show a sense of fun despite all this dark stuff that's going on, Andy goes home to his parents for Christmas with Miguel. Boom, 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 boom. Come on, baby, let the good times roll. Let's have some eggnog and presents. Notice how the family treats him probably the way they always did, with hugs and kisses. Of course, this movie was criticized for the idyllic Beckett family, and sure, this does feel overly wholesome, but the first major movie about AIDS probably had to be careful about how it portrayed the family. Bev and I talked about something similar in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington many years ago. That film was about corruption in the American Senate, which was pretty controversial in 1939. Believe it or not, that would be controversial, even in a fictional movie. And Columbia wouldn't let all of Travis's killings in Taxi Driver be black guys. In Paul Schrader's original script, Keitel's character and the other guys who get shot in the whorehouse were all black. In any case, I understand why they made these changes in all three movies. Maybe not changes in this one, but the other ones were changed, or at least weren't as strong as people thought they could be with what they're doing. They were, you know what I'm saying. When you're trying to make a popular entertainment out of a topic that's already tweaking noses, sometimes you have to ease off on the gas pedal to get the story told in the first place. I don't think people understand that even now. In any case, all the Becketts have Andy's back, although I think it would have been more honest if at least one person in the room seemed uncomfortable with him holding his baby sister. Or with, well, any of this. Because at least one person in a big family like this is not going to act so cool about Andy having AIDS. Where's the homophobic uncle? There's got to be at least one. Seven months pass and the case is on. Incidentally, the courtroom scenes weren't shot on a set. It was a real courtroom. Why build something fake when you can get the real thing? Especially when you're going to spend so much of the rest of the film on this location. In this location? On this location? Joe lays down Andy's case in his opening statement, ending with, They broke the law for firing his client without just cause. Mary Steenburgen plays Belinda Conine, the lead attorney representing Wyatt Wheeler. She sums up her opening statements by claiming that Andy's work was just not up to snuff, and she says he's angry because now he's dying and wants payback. He probably undoubtedly feels that way in a way, but also is right. Both things can be true. The first to testify is Roger Corman, a big-time client of Wyatt Wheeler. He apparently told Joe in a deposition about half a year ago that Andy was a great lawyer, 
but now he's saying that the work was just okay. Beckett won the man's case and all, but yawn. Why didn't you win it even more, Andy? Clearly Roger Corman, the man who produced so many B-movie <coughs> classics, was gotten to by Charles Wheeler. Corman's quite good in this movie, by the way, especially for a guy who did act sometimes, but wasn't a trained thespian. He's got more than one scene in this, too. Between witnesses, Joe has a drink in a watering hole and watches the footage on TV of when he and Andy left the court in front of a huge anti-gay protest. I love his hat, by the way, Joe's hat. His buddies accuse him of, let's say, changing teams. And Joe isn't happy about that. I guess Demi and the writer Ron Nicewaner needed to remind us that just because Joe is representing Andy, that doesn't mean he approves of how Andy lives. But Joe's going to come around, don't you worry. The second witness is a woman from Kenton's former law firm. She has AIDS too. The defense is trying to make the case that she wasn't fired because of bigotry. Of course, this isn't the same firm. Yeah, it's the same guy, but it's a different firm. She got the disease from a transfusion after she lost a plethora of blood while having a baby. Conversely, the defense is claiming that Andy got it because he lived fast and loose in gay clubs, so his life rapidly ending was his own fault. I like how the witness pipes up before leaving the stand that she doesn't think it matters how you got it. She's just trying to survive, which of course Andy is too. She's not judging the guy for getting it this way. I can see a tiny bit of a point about saying someone who got AIDS by having unprotected sex is a little less moral than getting it in a way you couldn't control. But when someone is sick, no matter how it happened, aren't we as decent people supposed to care about their well-being? We shouldn't just throw them in a snowbank and hope they quickly die because they didn't get the plague the right way. Anna Devere Smith is up next, testifying that she noticed something was wrong with Andy, but she didn't know what it was. Anna Devere Smith is... where's her name there? And Thea Burton... Her issue in the office, though, was racial discrimination. Oh, right, race does come up in Philadelphia, but not really concerning Denzel, concerns her. She says they didn't like when she wore big earrings and garish clothes. Be more American, they'd say. But she makes the point that she was being African-American. It's interesting, too, that Conine brings up that Anthea here was recently promoted. So how can they be bigots at Wyatt Wheeler if they promoted a black woman? Well, they could have been throwing a bone to look like nice guys, especially considering this case they're now dealing with. But also, people are complex. They can do crappy things to one minority while doing right by another minority. And she didn't have AIDS, and she's not gay, and she's not a guy who's gay. I'm not sure if we needed the next scene where a young black man in a pharmacy makes nice with Joe because we know Joe is still homophobic. We've had proof of that already. But the two actors are good here. Well, Denzel always is. The guy tells the Joester how important this case is, but uh uh-oh, this young fellow reveals that he's gay, so it goes badly. Joe tosses off another slur and storms out, not even paying for what's in his basket. Again, I'll judge this type of response 30 years after the fact. And the movie is using Joe to make a point about how a good human being is not always a good human being. And he's going to come around. But I have never understood why being hit on by a guy can't just lead to, thanks, but I'm not into dudes. Or ignore it. Or, I don't know. You want to hit him? You want to storm him out of the pharmacy? When I worked, I guess you'd call it pro bono at my former college newspaper in 1997 or 98, one of those years, my sister, who was the news editor, which was the job I had when I went to school there, so she called me in to help out with the paper for a while, told me that the entertainment editor was hitting on me one night. He had gone, and she said that to me. I didn't pick up on it. I just thought the guy was friendly. And if he thought I had the hotness, well, maybe he was right. He never made it clear to me, though. If he had asked me out, I think I would have said, I'm not gay, but thanks. See, not hard. And I'm never going to claim I'm on the right side of every issue or think absolutely everything about gay people is hunky-dory. But guys, just cool it. Maybe this pharmacy scene was in here to give Denzel something to do outside of the courtroom, although he just had that bar scene. But it's interesting to note that the best actor winner in this movie has barely spoken a line in quite a while. I think the last time Hank said anything was in the family scene at Christmas. Otherwise, he just sits there in court and lets his counselor do all the talking. Andy's secretary is next up on the witness stand. She talks about that supposedly misplaced file. She even gets all teary about it, even though that probably happened about a year before. Joe only asks a few questions of her, and the defense doesn't ask anything at all. Brad Whitford gets his turn on the grilling chair next, and Joe goes off on him, demanding to know if he's gay, using all the crappy euphemisms beyond just call him gay. Steenburgen objects and wonders why Joe is badgering his own witness. But Miller's point is, let's get out in the open. Everyone is thinking about what Andy does in his private life, and what everyone else does too, probably. It's a nice moment of aggression for a purpose, I guess. Although I wonder if any judge will let him go on like this, including explaining why he just did it. It feels a little phony and grandstanding. I don't really like this scene that much. Then Walter Kenton gets his moment in the sun on the stand, telling us about his Navy days and how he and his buddies treated a flamboyantly gay guy. The dude got swirly. Seems like it was a lot of swirlying, too. I like how Demi keeps cutting to the jury foreman, who's played by Daniel Von Bargen. He was Costanza's boss at one point on Seinfeld. DVB is either in the military or respects those who are because he's, oh yeah, bro, through most of Kenton's time on the stand. The woman in Kenton's former office who got AIDS is brought up. He says he feels sympathy for people who contracted this disease through no fault of their own. There it is. 
As for those who got it some other way, well, I guess they can't die quick enough for him. For the first time in forever, Andy gets to be the lead in a scene, as he and Miguel argue about his treatment. Andy is on an IV and... Is it chemo, actually? Do AIDS patients do chemo? That's what it looked like. Antonio Banderas was new to Hollywood in 1993. He's pretty good in the film. I got the feeling early on, though, before Andy was fired, but he was still working at home, that our man wasn't always loyal to the MiGs because there were guys hanging out in the loft who seemed to be more than just friends, the way they were looking at him. Although for the past few scenes, Hanks has had a wedding ring on, even though he hadn't been wearing one for most of the flick up to this point. And I guess it's just symbolic because the two men couldn't actually get married in 1993. It was legalized in Pennsylvania in 2014, then gay marriage became legal nationwide a year later. So rather than think about preparing for Andy's death, they decide to have some fun and throw a costume party. Joe shows up with Lisa. His costume is a lawsuit with paper stapled to his suit, which is almost as lazy as going as a ghost. But cheesy costume or not, at least the Millers are friendly with all these gays. Oh no. Of course, Lisa never had a problem with them in the first place, so she doesn't have to grin and bear anything here. Gay people were still banned from serving in the military when this film was made, which is part of the reason Demi has Andy and Miguel dress up as Navy officers. And Hanks looks pretty good in white, but holy free holies, Banderas is a vision. What follows is a scene that probably won Hanks' Oscar. The party is over and the two lawyers get to work. Andy's going to testify the next day. But before that, Miller responds to Andy's question, do you pray that he prays his baby is healthy and that the Phillies win the pennant? And the Phillies did win the pennant a few months before this movie came out, although obviously they didn't know that was going to happen while they were filming. The Phillies lost to the Blue Jays in the World Series, yay! But they did at least get that far. So okay, the opera scene that probably won Hanks the Oscar. Apparently the music was played live on the set, which is unusual because you can't control the voice track if music is part of the recording, although it allowed Hanks to really feel that opera. Andy describes to Joe what the lady is singing about. Hanks does a good job in this scene and it's well shot with a tight camera and impressionistic lighting changes. I guess it's a chance for Hanks to basically dance around with his IV stand and get passionate about opera, but also to show that music and art and love is what we live for. And Mr. Miller goes from being exasperated that Andy isn't taking the case seriously to being touched by what his client is going through in this moment, living the love out loud. Once the song is over, Joe tugs his collar a few times and races out of there. I like that Demi doesn't end the scene like that, though. Joe thinks about knocking on the door and going back in, but he smiles and does leave after all. I wonder what the direction was for Denzel to play about why he almost went back. What was he going to say or do? Was he maybe going to give the guy a bro hug? Come on, give your client a bro hug. And I could be right about Joe wanting a sweet embrace from somebody because the first thing he does when he gets home is to take his daughter out of her crib and hug her, although she barely wakes up. I wonder if they used to drug baby actors. Maybe they do now, even. Probably not now. Some of them barely seem to notice they're in a movie. This kid does not wake up, just like the kid in Do the Right Thing who seems to be passed right out, even while Rosie Perez is hollering at Spike Lee. Of course, Hector wasn't a newborn and he could take direction. He was probably told, to lay there and don't do anything. Considering the baby has to deal with people on the other side of the camera and hot lights and all that, I'm impressed she wasn't fussy and crying the whole scene. Or maybe this was take 15 and she cried her eyes out the other 14 times. And maybe she was drugged. So Andy takes the stand. And here's a touch I never noticed before. When the scene begins, he's saying that he was impressed with his law firm and their reputation. So he was thrilled they pursued him to work for them. But he was particularly impressed with Charles Wheeler. Demi's shot is up high behind the defendant's table looking at Andy in the distance. As he always is in these court scenes, Robards is sitting beside Oda Bobatunde, who is the other counselor along with Steam Virgin. And in this case, his arm is on the back of Bobatunde's chair. I hope I'm saying that right. Nothing odd about that, right? Arm on the chair. But the guy we already know is pretty bigoted, hastily pulls his arm away from the back of a man's chair after he hears a gay guy say that he was impressed by Charles. If that wasn't something Robards did in his own, then maybe Demi told him to, but either way, it's a really nice touch that I never noticed before, and it's a visual way of Wheeler saying yet again, I ain't gay. Though he's mad that they turfed him, Andy continues to big up Charles. His former boss was apparently the Dr. J of legal minds. Oh, and I have to note that the bailiff is wearing gloves when he has Andy sworn in, then he leaves the room for a minute, but comes back without gloves, and I bet carrying a different Bible. Because he and the good book might have gotten the cooties if he didn't take off those gloves and wash up. I believe it's a well-known fact that HIV can be transferred through scripture. Andy recalls a scene that took place several years earlier. The partners are hanging with Roger Corman in a steam room and telling off-color jokes. But Andy, back then, could barely contain his horror when wheelers crack about the way that gay guys fake an orgasm gets huge cackles. And back to the present, Andy confesses in court that he's relieved he never told these guys that he was gay for that reason alone. Andy tells Joe that he's an excellent lawyer and he loves practicing. What he loves most is that every now and again, not often, but occasionally, you get to be a part of justice being done. Which is the nutshell of this movie. There it is. Hanks just did Philadelphia in a nutshell for me. Oh crap, I did write one of those already. Oh yeah, here it goes. Philadelphia in a nutshell. Hanks' version is better, but I'm a dude anyway. 
Rooting for a wrongfully fired person dying of AIDS is one thing, but I have to root for a lawyer? That's asking too much! I'm only kidding. Most likely. I have good friends who are lawyers. Two or three of them, anyway. Counselor Kaneen's cross-examination digs into Andy's lifestyle, revealing that he went to gay theaters and had at least one sexual encounter there. And he lied to the people at his firm about being gay and having AIDS, although he says he never lied. Of course, he did lie about that bruise being on his head because he said he was hit by a racquetball, but it's not like it's impossible he did just take a ball to the head and thought his lesion was from that. Oh, and we find out here that he's lived with Miguel since the mid-80s, so I guess them being a committed couple isn't some new thing during the course of this movie after all. Or they were committed, and before he was diagnosed, Andy played around with those guys maybe that we saw in the loft many scenes ago. He was playing around when he went to that porno theater. Miguel wasn't there with him, I don't think. And anyway, I'm not judging, just pointing this out. I don't care what you do. You want to have sex with other people in your marriage? That's between you and your wife, or your husband, or the husbands, the wives. People say this film is soft, but it's not like what follows is easy to watch. After Conin proves that the lesion Andy says he currently has is not easy to see, so Walter maybe couldn't have easily deduced what was going on bruise-wise so many months ago, which is Andy's contention. But holy God, his body sure has some easy-to-see ones, which is what Joe points out on his redirect. I heard they got a man who had actual lesions on his own chest to double for Hanks. This poor guy is just covered in them. And Mr. Beckett says that these ones do resemble the one he had the night Walter figured out what was going on. It's Charles Wheeler's turn on the stand, and he, of course, insists he didn't fire Andy because he had AIDS. He claims that Andy was someone they invested in heavily, but he never delivered on the potential. Joe fires back at Wheeler in his cross-examination with, Are you gay? How dare you? Because Joe is pushing the theory that being confronted with the fact that one of Charles's trusted colleagues turned out to be a person he can't abide caused Wheeler to make Andy pay for it by taking away his job. But all of this means nothing when a very sick Andy gets up from the plaintiff's table and collapses, face first on the floor. It's quite a stunt. There's no way Hanks did all this, as the guy flops just face first. It's a Ric Flair face flop, only even better. And it's a galvanizing edit when you go from seeing Andy in the hospital with about a dozen doctors trying to revive him to a shot in the courtroom of his empty chair. The trial goes to the deliberation phase, although we only see the jury talking about it for maybe a minute or so. Von Bargen tears apart the defense's argument that the firm wouldn't give important cases to a mediocre guy they wanted to see rise to the occasion. They'd give cases like that to their very best. And maybe one of the other jurors can explain it to him, like he's a six-year-old. I love that Von Bargen paraphrases Joe here, because Joe does that a lot. Explain this to me like I'm an eight-year-old, a three-year-old, a six-year-old. But also does a mediocre Denzel impression while tossing off that quote. Three days later, the verdict is in. There's at least one holdout, but the majority does side with Andy, and the prosecution is going to get a huge settlement, although obviously there will be an appeal, and that number might come way down. But for now, the good guys really win. Oh, by the way, one quick thing I read online, which I find to be a more powerful moment in this movie, when Steenburgen does the whole thing about the lesions with Andy on the stand, she comes back and says, I hate this case. Apparently Steenburgen was just saying that because she hated that she had to play a person that did that to somebody. I'm getting a little touched here. Yeah. I need some water. Miller goes to the hospital to celebrate with the Becketts, overhearing Andy's doctor on the way in, telling Miguel and Andy's parents just how badly our man is doing, including that he can't see out of his right eye anymore. And in a 180 from the start of the movie, Joe does not shy away from a man with AIDS. He sits right beside him on the bed, in fact, and enjoys Andy's joke about a thousand lawyers being chained together at the bottom of the sea. It's a good start. Joey Jojo even makes close physical contact with our man as he helps put Andy's oxygen mask back on his face, even making sure to touch him tenderly on the cheeks once it's in place. You can say this movie didn't go far enough, and many people did, and probably still do, but moments like these can really teach people about something as serious as AIDS, that is not going to leap out of the man's eyeballs and worm its way into your nose. I wonder if when Joe says to Andy, I'll see you again, it's meant to be a meta type of thing. Denzel himself would no doubt believe that he will see a fellow Christian in the afterlife. Both actors are quite religious, like I said before, and while maybe Joe really does believe Andy has some time left and he'll get to see his fellow counselor in the flesh at least one more time, what he can be certain of is that they will see each other again, even if it's in the afterlife. That's what he believes. I don't have to believe it myself to be touched by how much it means to the characters and to the two men playing these characters. Here's what I love about this doctor I mentioned a while back, the Karen Finley character. She checks Andy's vision and then winks at him. It's such a sweet moment, but also notice that she does it with her right eye, so his good left eye can see her do that. I've never forgotten that wink. Sometimes actors with not even one minute of screen time can make the most powerful impressions. I didn't cry during the movie. I'm almost doing it now. But as the family is filing out, Andy's brother breaks down and cries for a few seconds. Mama Beckett is the last person to say goodnight to her beautiful boy before they all leave Miguel to watch over his husband. Banderas doesn't get to do very much that's remotely fun with this role, but I love his little finger dance thing when he closes the hospital room door. They're alone at last. He even kisses Andy's fingers. And even though Miguel told Joe that he just wants to get Andy home, 
The man is ready to die. We don't get the incredible scene that Bruce Davison had with his partner and longtime companion. That guy was at the very end and Davison kept saying, you can go, just let go. Here it's simply Andy telling Miguel he's ready and the scene cuts to the phone ringing at the Miller house in the middle of the night and Joe finding out that his client is dead. Andy's memorial is loaded with people, including, I think, Bob Seidman. So he's making at least some amends for not trying to do something about what happened to Andy. Of course, all of Andy's family is there and the Millers show up with their baby. Miguel's parents show up too. Andy's sister, Jill, has had a baby of her own. And Dowd is wonderful as Jill, by the way. I'll talk about her again in a few minutes. And we close out Philadelphia by seeing home movies of when Andy and his siblings were young and innocent. And Neil Young's song plays along. I didn't cry during the movie, although I almost did a few times in this recording, but this last scene nearly did get me. I've already mentioned a few times that this movie was accused of playing it too nice, but this isn't a documentary. TriStar wanted to bring awareness to AIDS in a movie that people would see in fairly big numbers. Did this film move the needle to allow more realistic and grittier films about this topic get made? I think it did. We can't always have stark realism if we want as many people as possible to understand something and empathize with those that they might otherwise fear. Give the moderates a chance. They don't know everything that you think you know. They might come around and be on your side one day, but sometimes you need to give them a little time and also provide some candy with the medicine, especially older people. But yes, a lot of gay activists and critics didn't like the film very much. Some argued that it's actually pretty closeted. The sex is almost non-existent, and for a gay movie, men don't touch each other all that much, let alone kiss. Yes, Andy and Miguel probably couldn't be intimate through much of this story anyway, considering Andy's condition, but it really is play like they're an old married couple who just do not get it on anymore. And who wouldn't want to make out with Antonio Banderas? But is desexifying this story a deal breaker? It also wouldn't have made the movie any better, I don't think, if we saw Hanks and Banderas making out or having sex two or three different times. This is a courtroom drama. We don't see the Marines do much marining, and a few good men either. I suppose they could have taken the flashback scene in the porno theater further than they did, but I just don't know that a minute or two of, or even seconds worth of dudes bumping makes a big difference in a movie like this. If the movie was rated R, which it isn't, it's PG, there might be room for boinking, but in 1993, if you want to be PG, you just had to be more like Leave It to Beaver than Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. Although, do they even get sexy in that? I've never seen that show. I don't know. Think of a show that has explicit gay sex. That's what I'm saying here. No one has to like Philadelphia. They can have their problems with it. If this film doesn't measure up for you, fine. But just don't let an imperfect movie be the enemy of a necessary movie, especially 30 years ago when just getting what we got was a very big deal. I want to share a personal experience I had with this movie when it came out. I saw it on the big screen with five or six college friends in the early part of 94. There were a couple of young women in the group for sure, but I'd say there were at least three other guys. A few of them were clearly uncomfortable afterwards. I guess they were during it too, but I don't remember any of them walking out, nor did I notice them shifting in their seats. Maybe those fellows were homophobic. They were mostly the same age as me, or maybe a little older. I wasn't even 20 years old yet. I just don't think they knew what they were in for when we bought our tickets. Although I don't remember how I felt when I first saw this. I'm sure I was moved. The actors are terrific and it's hard not to feel empathy for someone dying horribly. I also don't remember ever having a problem with gay people. I've never been someone who threw around gay slurs. In any case, when it comes to gay people, trans people, whatever the different sexuality is, do no harm. At least that. Leave them alone. You don't have to march in the pride parade. Just don't be a jerk. Sure, I find someone like Jonathan Van Ness to be pretty annoying. Who's more annoying or more over the top than Donald Trump? Plus, I'm the guy who's always admitting when I find men attractive. Denzel is certainly hot in this, and so is Banderas. The last solo podcast I did was filled with me mooning over Rita Hayworth. Well, allow me to moon over Mr. Washington and Mr. Banderas for a few seconds. Moon, moon, moon. Beautiful men. So the cast. Tom Hanks just might hold the record for most movies covered on this channel. And if he doesn't, he's got to be in the top three. This is the 11th time he's come up. We've done Splash, Big, A League of Their Own, Sleepless in Seattle, which was just a few months ago, Forrest Gump, Apollo 13, Toy Story, Saving Private Ryan, Castaway, and we even did a Now Playing Project podcast of Captain Phillips in late 2013. That was when we just saw a movie on the big screen and did a review that night or within a day or two. Willem Dafoe was in something like 11 of our flicks too, but he wasn't always, or even often, in the starring role the way the Tomster has been in everything except A League of Their Own. And if you think about it, we've actually reviewed even more Hanks flicks than that because of our Oscars preview shows. He was nominated for Best Supporting Actor for A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, so we analyzed that performance at least briefly, and three of his other flicks were up for Best Picture, so he's come up even more than those 11 times. Oh, and it just hit me. Not that this is extraordinary or anything, but he's Andy here, and then his kid in the Toy Story movies, the first three of them anyway, is Andy. I wonder if Pixar did that as a tribute to this character. Just like he did for Castaway, Hanks dropped a lot of weight for this role. Curiously, he was coming off of being a little overweight in A League of Their Own just the year before. Hanks has said that maybe he got diabetes because of these big weight fluctuations. If that doesn't also happen to Christian Bale, the king of massive weight loss and sometimes huge weight gain, 
Well, Batman should feel lucky that he didn't, although maybe Hanks is wrong, but there does seem to be a connection. It's a shame that Oscars so often go to actors who starve themselves or pack on a bunch of poundage, but that's the way it is, and Tom no doubt earned a lot of respect just for going to that level. Plus, in some ways for people, this probably felt like a bit of a comeback. He was great in League of Their Own, but not the lead in that, and he'd been in the wilderness a little for, what, three or four years after the big hits in the 80s. Denzel Washington hasn't come up quite as often for us on this channel. We've reviewed his brilliant work in Malcolm X and in his first Oscar win in glory. Come on! And that's it until today. Although Chris and I discussed the dubs a few times in our sports movie podcast, Scoring at the Movies. Who's ever called him the dubs before? I just did. We talked about He Got Game, The Hurricane, and Remember the Titans, which were in three consecutive years, actually, from 1998 to 2000. And in a way, Bev and I did discuss his work in more recent times because of our Oscars preview shows. He was up for performances in Fences and The Tragedy of Macbeth, so he's come up a few times that way. Hanks and Washington each have two Academy Awards, but their co-star in this, Jason Robards, won a pair of trophies of his own long before these guys were, I think, even acting in Hollywood. We've reviewed All the President's Men, which was his first of two consecutive Oscar wins. The other was Julia. Plus, Robards came up when we chatted about Once Upon a Time in the West and Parenthood. J. Robes' final big screen appearance was a tragically fitting one. He dies of cancer in PTA's Magnolia, and the man himself died of lung cancer about a year after Magnolia came out. Oh, and here's one last fun fact about Jason Robards. I believe that Jason and Jennifer Jason Lee was a tribute to Mr. Robards, who I guess was chums with their dad, Vic Morrow. Mary Steenburgen is yet another member of this cast who had her name called on Oscar night. She won from Melvin and Howard with Jason Robards way back in 1980. We haven't covered that, but we have covered Parenthood, where she shares time with Robards yet again. I'm not sure they have screen time together, actually, Melvin and Howard, but they're both in it. And she's Buddy's off-key singing stepmom in Elf. She's singing... She's singing. Apparently, John Leguizamo could have played Andy's lover in this, but Antonio Banderas got the part instead. I love saying that that way. Johnny Legs chose to do the live-action Super Mario Brothers instead. What a good choice. The only Banderas joint we've reviewed before today was his small role in Interview with the Vampire, but he was also so outstanding as the voice of Puss in Boots in those Shrek sequels, and then in his own Puss spin-off movies, including one, I think, just last year. We covered the first Shrek two years ago, and Banderas isn't in that, but his name came up because we couldn't stop saying how much we loved him in Shrek 2. He is so funny in that movie. Joanne Woodward had been established as a legend for decades, although she wasn't working as often at this point in her career. A lot of TV movies and voiceover roles. But she did this in 1993 and was also the narrator for Scorsese's The Age of Innocence that same year. Guess what? Woodward was another Oscar winner in this cast. She took it home for The Three Faces of Eve way back in the 50s. Paul Newman's longtime wife often worked with her man, which of course Hanks would go on to do too when Paul played the crime boss in Road to Perdition. I don't love that movie, but I did like the Hanks Newman father son dynamic, just as the Hanks Woodward dynamic is nice here. Ron Vodder is the lawyer who laments that he didn't talk to Andy about having HIV, which is a regret he'll have for the rest of his life. Vodder acted in quite a few films before this, including Sex Lies and Videotape, a film we'll probably review early next year, and he was in Silence of the Lambs for Demi as well. Unfortunately, he didn't live long past when this picture came out. Vodder died in April 1994 of an AIDS-related heart attack, so right after the Oscars, I guess it was. And here's some irony. The studio was reluctant to let him be in Philadelphia because they knew he had the disease and might not be able to work if he got sick. And it was Demi who pointed out the irony of discriminating against him, considering the plotline in the movie they were making. Bradley Whitford has a small role in this, as he did in Scent of a Woman the year before, so Brad knew what it was like to be in Best Actor-winning films two years in a row because Al Pacino hooahed his way to gold in Scent... Then Hanks won the very next year. Whitford's best-known thing is probably still the West Wing, but we also know he would have voted for Obama a third time if he could in Get Out, which we covered, of course. That review is in our archives. Tracy Walter has a small role as the librarian who wishes Andy would make himself scarce. He was Bob the Goon in Batman four years earlier. Robert Ridgely was the Colonel in Boogie Nights four years later. We covered that flick last year. Charles Napier plays the judge here and worked with Demi all the time, including being one of Lecter's two guards who are savagely killed in the Silence of the Lambs. I think it's him that ends up having his entrails pulled out and he's hung up on the bars when the other cops storm into the room. There's a great visual. Would never happen. How did he do that? Lecter's not magic, but still a great visual. Anna DeVere Smith worked with Demi a few other times, but found a home on TV. She was a regular on Nurse Jackie for several years, and I think was in quite a few episodes of The West Wing, which was, of course, a Bradley Whitford show. Legendary independent producer and the man who gave Demi a start in the film business, Roger Corman, acted a few times for Johnny D, including having a small part in Silence of the Lambs. And Anne Dowd played Jill Beckett so well before going on to do dastardly things in The Handmaid's Tale and in Hereditary, a film we've reviewed. But man, is she ever sweet and likable in this movie. And not that many scenes to establish that either. She's very good. She's usually great as a villain, but I'd love to see her get a major role that's as sweet as this again. 
Many gay men have roles in this. Some of them had HIV or even full-blown AIDS. You see a lot of them at the memorial at the end. Plenty of them were dead before the end of production or soon after it was over. One incredible advancement in medicine is that it seems like a lot fewer people die when they get AIDS these days. And for many years, I think this is true. And I believe even many of them have had long and fairly ordinary lives as long as they take their medicine. Look at Magic Johnson. He's still alive and still looks great. He was diagnosed not that long before this movie went into production. Yet he's still a force, owning sports franchises and living what seems to be a great life. So we're talking more than 30 years, still alive, still doing well. Although as South Park points out, money cured AIDS, or at least HIV. The beloved Magic Johnson, of all people, getting HIV helped people realize, oh, it isn't just a gay plague anymore, is it? It's terrible that Magic couldn't finish his NBA career on his own terms, but him getting the disease was, as weird as this is to say, a great PR move for it. If a virile, straight, black celebrity can get it, then anyone can. Although what bugs me... Oh, he was cheating on his wife. That's probably how he got it. Didn't he say that at the time? Although what bugs me about the attitude, even... I'm not judging them. Do what you want in your marriage. Not my business. Although what bugs me about that attitude, even when people did think it was something only gay men had to deal with, is... Okay, so they did something you think is immoral by having sex with other men. And anyone who isn't committed to one lover should probably always use condoms. That's good advice. No matter who you're sleeping with. But if a person gets AIDS, regardless of how, then they should just die? Because your morals say they should? Their director was, of course, Jonathan Demme. He was coming off the Oscar win for Sounds of the Lambs. That was his only Academy Award and also his only nomination. He did something wild and married to the mob before this. And not that much I liked after it, except for Rachel getting married. That was pretty good. Although, as I said, most of his movies got positive reviews. I didn't love them. Other people did, I guess. He also directed more documentaries and TV than I expected to see in his resume. Like all directors, Demi has some trademarks. A big one for him was to have actors look directly into the camera, just barely off it, which happens a lot in this movie. It's one way to connect the audience to have the character stare right at them. Just like Philadelphia was, Demi's prior movie was criticized. The Silence of the Lambs was controversial because of the Buffalo Bill character. He's trans, and yet he's also a vicious serial killer. For that matter, and this has nothing to do with Demi, but we've got two bisexual women in Basic Instinct, which interestingly came out the year between Demi's two pictures in question. Catherine and Roxy aren't just sexually adventurous, they're killers. So while they're all good movies, it didn't speak well about Hollywood that a couple of these films could be argued were saying, if you're not straight, then you're probably going to be out for blood. And I don't think it's as simple as a Hollywood-wide belief that anyone who isn't straight is a killer. I think it has more to do with the notion that anyone who's a little different is made to feel subhuman, and they probably want to lash out for being treated like that. But most of them don't in real life. In a movie, you can literally lash out. Literally lash out. It's just good drama. I don't know, maybe the protesters are right, and screenwriters and directors and producers and studio heads, and even actors just hate anyone who isn't straight. I don't think anything is as simple as that. If you do, all right, that's your opinion. It's complex. Let's have a conversation. Email me. We'll give that information in a few minutes. Ron Nicewaner wrote this, and he also jotted down Swing Shift for Demi nearly 10 years earlier. He went on to write The Painted Veil and several episodes of Homeland. He also produced 36 episodes of Claire Danes' TV show, Homeland. Demi was a producer on this, along with several men who often produced his pictures, Ron Bozeman, Edward Saxon, Kenneth Utt, and Gary Getzman. Getzman not only worked with Demi other times, but went on to produce many of Tom Hanks's flicks. I believe he's an executive in Hanks's Playtone Records production company. Maybe not, but I think he might be. Saxon was one of the guys who won a gold naked guy for producing Silence of the Lambs, and then went on to work on adaptation with Demi nine years later. Utt and Bozeman won Best Picture for Silence with Saxon. Oh, and Ut plays one of the jurors in Philadelphia. He's the older, balding guy with a sour look on his face. Tak Fujimoto shot this, as he did, The Silence of the Lambs. Craig McKay cut the picture, as he did, The Silence of the Lambs. Howard Shore composed the music, as he did, for Silence of the Lambs. Demi liked his team, and just like most powerful directors, used them on his projects again and again. To wrap up this monologue, I certainly give Philadelphia a very solid thumbs up. Apart from how important it was to get this particular mainstream movie made and try the best they could to make it as honest to the situation as possible, Demi and his team made it entertaining. It's certainly very watchable. Hanks always brings so much humanity to his characters. He's one of the greatest leading men in history. As is Denzel. And it's really his movie. It's the Rain Man thing I've brought up many times. Hoffman won the Oscar. He's great. But that movie really belongs to Cruz, especially The Ark. In Philadelphia's case, the story is how he goes from being an outright homophobe to a man who probably won't overreact next time if a gay man tries to pick him up on a pharmacy. Maybe he'd be a little more graceful and just say, no thanks. Take the Homer Simpson approach. Sure, he's flattered, although we know Joe isn't curious, but the answer is no. That's Philadelphia for you. In two weeks, I'll be back in the chair on my own, and I'll be talking about Ball of Fire, the Barbara Stanwyck, Gary Cooper rom-com. Howard Hawks directed that. In three days, though, Bev will join me in your ears as we discuss, for the second time, mind you, Spike Jones is even more relevant than it was ten years ago, Her. 
We reviewed it back at the very end of 2013. I checked. It was December 29th. It will be called a Now Playing Project podcast. We were trying to cover brand new flicks and get more attention than we were getting when we were still so new as podcasters. So we'd go see a new movie and record a slapdash chat about it that night. We didn't have any context because how could we when it was brand new? But now we do. So let's see how her holds up. And that will be the last of the four re-reviews we'll do this year. Re-reviews. We already did chat number two for Inside Lewin Davis, which I think we posted with her many years ago together for the Now Playing Project podcast. We also did 12 Years a Slave this year and The Wolf of Wall Street. If you liked what you heard here, or even if you hated it with the passion of a zillion sons, then tell me. You can email have you ever seen podcast at gmail.com or you can fire off a whack at tweetixes to me and or to Bev. I'm at moviefiend51 and she's at Bev Ellis Ellis. Our podcasts go up on YouTube sometime later in the day after they hit the podcast apps. Our channel is at H-Y-E-S Ellis or type have you ever seen into the search bar on the tube monster. Usually there's quite a few hours between those two things because there is, but you get it on YouTube if you like it that way. At some point the day it gets up on the podcast app. How about rating and reviewing our show, either on YouTube or through your podcast app? Like, share, talk us up, and for the love of Tom Hanks, subscribe. And you should also do yourself a favor and check out Spark Plug Coffee. If you like 20% discounts, you can get one by using our H-Y-E-S promo code. Go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S. Thanks for listening today. Join us on Monday when we get into Spike Jones's business and talk about her. Meantime, I'm going to go explain things to people like they're an eight-year-old. And maybe I'll learn a little something about empathy while I'm at it. And cut.